Hey guys, welcome to a new video. In this video here, we're going to take a look at the YOLO performance metrics. So this is basically just how we can evaluate our update detection models. So once we've trained our models, we want to look at a bunch of different metrics, both during training, but especially like after training, we want to actually like validate our model to see if we need to retrain it, if it's good enough for our application and projects and so on. And that's what we're going to cover in this video. So let's just jump straight into documentation here. You can go inside the guides and when we're inside the guides, you can go over here to the left YOLO performance metrics. And these are the different performance metrics that we can take a look at after our model is done training, especially for update detection. So over here to the right, we have the table of contents. This is a really good overview just to see what we're going to go over and also just to get a quick overview over what is performing metrics, what are different kind of like elements when we're evaluating update detection models. So first of all, we have some introduction, update detection metrics of different variations, different metrics that we're taking a look at, the most common ones. There's tons of different metrics out there that we can take a look at when we're talking about update detection, segmentation, instant segmentation, and so on. But we're going to take a look at the most common ones and which ones you should be looking at and also do some case studies. So how can we interpret the output, class wide metrics, speed metrics, Cocoa metrics elevation, visual outputs and so on, how we can choose the right metrics for a specific application and project. And then we're going to do some case studies. So the case studies here are very important and also pretty interesting to take a look at. So sometimes you might actually not have a good model just because you have 100% pre precision because there are some tweaks here and there. Just because your model has 100% accuracy, it doesn't mean that you have a good model. And we're going to cover that throughout this video. So definitely stay tuned for that. This is very important when you're working with object detection model and just the machine learning and deep learning models in general. Then after that, we can also do some connection and collaborations further on. We get a short introduction here. You can read it through, go through the documentation here. There's a ton of different guides also over here to the left. We both have the real world projects, but also a lot of different tutorials on how you can use the Autolytics and YOLO V8 frameworks. But right now we're going to cover the most important object detection metrics. So the first one here is the intersection over union. You can read the short description here as well. For the intersection over union, it is basically just our ground truth bounding box and our predicted bounding box. So how much are those bounding boxes intersecting? Then we also have average precision here. So precision is basically just like how many predictions do we get accurate? Then we have our mean average position, which is basically just extending our average position, but then we're taking a mean across multiple object classes. So this is actually like the one that we will mainly be looking at, especially during our training, just to see if our mean error position is actually increasing. And then we have two different metrics, both the mean error position dot five, and then also mean error position dot five um, to 0.95 in intervals of 0 0.05. And the reason why we actually want to do that in intervals, because again, we're taking the mean, but it's basically just the confidence score for our position or like a precision in different intervals. And then we're taking the mean of that. So those are the most important ones when we're actually looking at the training and also the precision and recall. So when we're talking about the precision and recall, we kind of like have to take a look at both of them at the same time, because let's say that we have 10 people in the image and we do five predictions, we predict that, okay, we detect five people in this image, then we have a very high precision, but the recall is not good because we miss half of our predictions, which we should have predicted in our image as well. That's kind of like why the precision and recall goes hand in hand, and we can combine that into harmonic mean with the F1 score. So this is the metric that you can take a look at as well. And again, all of these metrics here, you can take a look at directly while your YOLO V8 models are training, but also after that. So after each individual run, we actually get all of these metrics locked. We can even see the graphs. Are they increasing? Are the loss, losses decreasing and so on? So that is very important to take a look at. Then we can see how to calculate these metrics for the YOLV8 model. Again, all of that is done out of the box. But again, you can also see how you can go in and do it, how we can interpret the output. So here we have the class image instances. We have the box here as well. So the mean error position of these intervals that are talked about. We have the position recall and so on. So this is basically the accuracy of the detected objects indicating how many detections were correct. So again, this is if we have 10 people in the frame, we're predicting five. So that is actually like a high accuracy. But again, our recall, which is the ability of the model to identify all instances of an object in the image. So we can still have a low recall with high precision and we don't want to have that. Then we also have the mean errors precisions. We already went over that. We have the speed metrics. So this is basically just our inference speed for accuracy. If you want to do real time update detection scenarios and so on, let's say we want to run 30 frames per second, we might need to go with a smaller model. So we can also go in and look at the speed metrics for our model. We have the Kogo metrics elevation, visual outputs. Again, we can also go in and take a look at these graphs directly. 
all of them will be plotted. You can go and extract them from the folders, which will automatically be generated when you train your own models. You can see the F1 score curve, the precision recall curve, where ideally we want to have those two values going towards one. We have a confusion matrix, basically just all the classes. So after I've trained a model, the first thing that I look at is the confusion matrix. We want to have all the classes in the diagonal because we basically just have the predictions and the ground truth on each axis. And then we want to ideally have all the values in the diagonal because then our model is doing a great job. So here we can also directly go in and see our validation batch labels, validation batch predictions and so on. Just present them if you're training in a Google Colab notebook and you can just see your validation set, you can see the predictions visualized on top of your uh, images that the model has been trained on. So you can visually see the outputs, just evaluate your model. That is also very important. See how the optic detection model is working. When you're doing predictions, how does the bounding box look? Is it fitting the optic nicely? Where does it miss some detections? You can even go in and evaluate, okay, where are the different scenarios? Where are the edge cases? Where is my model good? Where can it do predictions and so on? Because again, the position recall curve, they don't, because the other metrics here, they don't show you like what are specific samples, where are your model not performing good? It just tells you that your model is not performing good or is performing good. And then you need to go in and validate that visually as well. So this is how you can choose the right metrics. We already went over that. So for real-time applications, we also want to take a look at the frames per seconds, but you guys are probably familiar with that. Even though we want very high frames per seconds, we can always optimize our model, export it here with Ultralytics as well, optimize it into our specific framework, specified for hardware, could be like Intel hardware, Nvidia hardware, ONNX, and so on. So we can still optimize our model even after training it. So let's take some case studies here just to end this video off here, and then you guys know everything about these perform metrics. So case one, we have a situation where our mean error precision and F1 score are suboptimal, but while recall is good, precision isn't. So here we can see that in the inter interpretation and the action, there might be too many incorrect detections. Tightening confidence thresholds could reduce these, though it might also slightly decrease recall. So again, you both get the situation, but you also get the action. What did you do? Should you actually go in and retrain your model? What metrics should you look at? Or what different kind of parameters can you tune on? So often we can tune on the intersection or union, confidence score, and so on. Case two here is we have a situation, our mean error position and recall are acceptable, but our intersection over union is lacking. So our bounding box is not fitting perfectly to the annotations or the ground truth that we actually wanted to. So here we can see that the action, the model, the text objects will, but might not be localizing them precisely. So we can go and refine the bounding box predictions, which might actually go in and help because we're able to detect our objects. Our bounding boxes does not fit good on the act like objects. So that might be an error in your data set. You can go in and fine tune that, go in and refine your labels, change the labels, and also just like make your bounding boxes better in your data set. So that might be an indication of that. The last one here is some classes have much lower average position than others, even with a decent overall mean average position. And the action here is that these classes might be more challenging for the model. Using more data for these classes or adjusting class weights during training could be beneficial. It could also be if you have imbalance in your data set, let's say that you only have a few instances or like a few examples for one class, and then you have another class where you have a bunch of examples that the model is just like overfitting a bit too. But again, yeah, again, you can add more data for these classes to just even out the imbalance in your data set or adjust the class weights during training. So definitely go in and learn about these metrics. Remember them when you're evaluating your models, even though you have watched this video here, make sure that you go into the documentation, read all of it through. It will just take 10, 15 minutes and you will get a way better understanding of all these different performance metrics. This will help you significantly when you're training your own models. Because again, if you don't know how to look at the metrics, you might not end up with a good model at the end for your own applications and projects. I hope you guys have learned a ton. Definitely going to read this documentation through. I can only recommend that. Or else I'll just see you next week, guys. Until then, happy learning.